let me just, on a personal note, um, thank you. CWA, when I first ran 10 years ago, was the first union to endorse me, and I will never forget that. I appreciate it very much. I want to I wanna thank um, uh, Chris Shelton for his uh, leadership, and I want to thank uh, Shane Larson for staying connected to me over the last few years. Uh, he has assimilated this need to get out and fix the system and fight big money um, in a way that's very powerful and has demonstrated to me CWA's commitment and the commitment of its uh, membership to that issue, to taking our government back. And I appreciate his friendship and his support um, in our efforts. I also want to thank you right up front. I want to thank you. I could, I could congratulate you for what just happened in terms of winning that, that strike. But what I really want to do is thank you for the strike. Thank you for standing up for workers in this country. And thank you for showing so many working people across the country that when you fight, when you stand, when you march, you can win. And I was proud. I was proud to march with you on the picket line in Baltimore, uh, out in Towson and Timonium in my district, uh, to be a small part of the effort. I wish you didn't have to be doing so much of this on your own. I wish that Congress and Washington could be standing next to you and fighting just as hard as you're fighting out there on the picket lines. But Unfortunately, our Congress these days in Washington and our government is beholden to special interests and big money, and they have a different agenda. You won that strike, but you know, CWA knows better than anybody, because this is one of the most enlightened and visionary uh, unions in our country. Uh, when, you, when you go to the mat, you don't just do it for your own members, and you don't just do it on your own issues, you do it to help working people everywhere. So you know better than, than anybody that there's so many people out in our country that are still hurting, that are economically dislocated, politically disempowered and disenfranchised, that there's, peop there's so many people living in poverty, there's so many working people working two and three jobs that are living in poverty in the richest nation on earth. There's something wrong with that. There are children in America who go to bed every night and they haven't had enough to eat that day. And so all these people out there looking at Washington and Congress and their government feeling left out and locked out and disrespected and not consequential anymore. And they're just asking for some help, for some sustenance, for some opportunity. And I remember Dr. King's words when he was in Memphis. He said, somewhere the creator of the universe is looking at those with power, the power to give opportunity and provide help and sustenance and pick people up, like the power that exists in Washington. The creator of the universe is looking there and saying, I was hungry and you fed me not. America is hungry for leadership that supports working people. America is hungry for leadership and commitment and dedication and representation, that's what I am, I'm a representative in the U.S. Congress. Representation that will put the priorities of working people first, of the broad public first, of America first, not the interests of some elite group in New York and Washington that right now thinks that they're the ones running the country. So we got to address these problems, but here's the problem. The problem is that in America now, 
to win a congressional seat, every two years you got to raise $1.6 million. And there's only one place to go to get that money if you're running for Congress. You got to go up to K Street and do a fundraiser with a bunch of lobbyists and lawyers. They're the ones with the deep pockets. They're the ones that can write the big checks. And I know the unions are, are trying to compete. And they're writing the packed checks to try to help candidates that want to do the right thing. But here's the reality. Here's the ratio. For every $1,000 check unions in America can write, Corporate America and the multinational corporations and Wall Street and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce can write $17,000 worth of checks. So that's not a fair fight. And when you go up to K Street to raise your money, you're hanging around with a lot of people that are representing those interests I just mentioned. They're the ones that are writing the trade deals. For this country. They're the ones that are writing the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal, which you oppose and I oppose. But here's the problem. If you come back to Washington, if you come back to Capitol Hill, if you come back to the chamber and you've just raised $10,000 at some fancy cocktail party up on K Street, hanging around with a bunch of people who think that that trade deal is the greatest thing coming down the pike. It affects the way you think. Because human beings are human beings. If you become too dependent on money that's coming from a certain source and a certain group of interest, then you develop a blind spot that favors that group because you got to raise $1.6 million to win your campaign. So the people that can write you the checks, they're the ones that get the access. The people who write the checks, they end up writing the policy because Congress and the institution will lean in the direction of the people who've got the money, the people who are powering their campaigns, which is why we got to create a whole new way of funding campaigns in America that can break the dependency on the big money and the special interests and return government to the people of the United States. So, so you're saying, Sarbanes, well, that sounds great, but how are you going to do that? Well, we looked back at the history of campaign finance reform. Yes, that's the phrase that makes everybody's eyes glaze over because it gets complicated. And we said, you know what? We can do this real simple. And we authored something. I'm the author of something. We got 150 co-sponsors in Congress, something called the Governed by the People Act, which would create a whole new system. I say to people who are angry and left out and locked out and feel like they don't have a voice and they want to grab a pitchfork and stamp their feet, I say to them, don't get mad, get even. Let's go build a new system, a whole new system for funding campaigns in America that puts you first, that puts working people at the center of the equation, that gives them the power. We can do this. The Government by the People Act would give every American a $25 tax credit to step into the ring and make a political contribution, right? That's your voice coming onto the playing field. Because I know it's important to have transparency and disclosure and get a constitutional amendment. You know, we got to deal with the super PACs and the big money. But that's just putting a referee on the field of the democracy. It still leaves you and America up in the bleachers watching the democracy play out on the field. And you can blow the whistle when some super PAC goes out of bounds, but you're still not on the field. The Government by the People Act says... 
We're going to bring you out of the bleachers and onto the field of your own democracy where you call the plays, where you have the power, where you're consequential. That's what we did. So $25 gets you onto the field. But then what we do is we come behind that with matching funds. Six to one. Six to one matching funds. And what does that do? You all know this better than anybody else. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? If if you can make a $50 contribution to a candidate that needs to raise $1.6 million, that candidate still can't hear you. They can't hear you. Your $50 isn't going to get their attention, but if a six to one match comes in behind it, your voice just got to be $350 loud. And now the candidate wants to come find you. Now the candidate says, wait a second, I could go up to K Street and raise my $10,000 and hang around with a bunch of people in suits who can't vote for me, are never going to lick an envelope for me, are never going to knock on a door for me, they don't even live in my district. Or, or I could go do a house party in my district, 30 people come, they give $50 using their $25 tax credit, that's $1,500, plus a 6 to 1 match comes behind it. That's another $9,000, $10,500 you just raised by spending time with real people in your district. That's power. That's how we change it. And here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. You go up to K Street, and the topic of Social Security comes up. And everybody starts saying, well, and you can be a Democrat or Republican in that room. I don't care. Well... We can raise the retirement age. Let's take it up to 69 or 70. Because everybody's living longer. And everybody's healthier than they used to be. Well, the people in that room think that. Because they all have personal trainers. They're playing squash Friday mornings. They've been in desk jobs their whole life. But you come away from that environment and you're thinking, well, we can raise the retirement age. It's not a problem. You start to think like the people you spend time with. And if you spend time with the people that have all the money, your priorities are going to be different. But if you have that house party in your district and 30 people come there from the neighborhood, there's at least two or three people who've been lifting boxes their whole lives and they're limping to retirement age. And they say to you, don't you dare change those benefits. I need those benefits. I need them at 62, not just 65. You start to think like the people you spend time with. Don't you want your representatives and your members of Congress to spend time with the people of this country so those are the priorities that they put first? I'm going to wrap up here. When, when I was a kid, my father, Paul Sarbanes, used to take me... <clears throat> I mean, I was little, down to the Steelworker Hall on Dundalk Avenue in Baltimore. Those were the days when Beth Steele was strong down at Sparrows Point. And you'd get down there in the Steelworker Hall, there'd be 10,000 people in there. Now you go down there and you shout your name and you, it echoes. There'd be 10,000 people in that room. Well, what if candidates, because they knew that working people, that everyday citizens out there, could power their campaign because we put this kind of new system in place? What if they started showing up in those places again? You know America would be better because if you look at the history of this country, Every single time, every period of our history where labor has been strong, the middle class has expanded. Our economy has been strong. Labor is the canary in the coal mine for whether our country can make it. If labor is strong, America can be strong. If, if labor is weak and under attack, America is under attack. We can build a system of funding campaigns 
that gives power back to the people. That's what the Government by the People Act is all about. And this will happen, ladies and gentlemen. And the reason it's going to happen is because this desire for change has become a relentless force in American politics. It will not be denied. And if we steer it towards these kinds of changes that can give you a voice, can give working people a voice across the country, we can make a change. I know it's going to happen because the American people want it, but I know it's going to happen also because of people like Shane and Chris and others in your leadership who have committed to supporting this kind of change. It will happen because CWA will be there to make it happen. Thank you all.